Welcome everyone to the April webinar series. Uh, this is Accessible Documents Part 1. My name is Gabby DeYoung and I'm a member of the IT Accessibility Team. And um, today we're going to talk about uh, techniques for creating accessible Word documents and accessible Google documents um, and how to export to PDF. So let's take a, a closer look at our agenda for, uh, for this afternoon. Um, so first, we'll get an opportunity to experience what it's like uh, to consume uh, inaccessible content. Um, and then we'll talk specifically about techniques for creating accessible Word documents uh, and Google documents, um, as I mentioned before. And then uh, we'll also take a look at what is required uh, for, um, uh, for accessible PDF documents. Um, I'll also show you how to use the accessibility checker that is built into Office and that can help guide you create more to create more accessible PDF. Uh, I'm sorry, to help you create more accessible Word documents. Um, and then if there's time, I think there should be time, we'll take a look at uh, an accessible PDF and a tag tree and um, what that means uh, for screen readers. So first, I wanted to present to you an example of inaccessible content of a website or a, a digital document, um, it doesn't particularly matter, and how users of assistive technology would consume that information. So on this slide, we have an example of a syllabi for a fictional physics course. All of the information to complete the course is contained um, within this information here, um, including course objectives, reading assignments, grading rubric, um, et cetera. Um, so with that said, I'm going to ask the audience if you can tell me what the required reading is for week three. So I'll give you a moment to review this information and then go ahead and type your answers in the chat or you can unmute yourself and, and speak your answer. So we'll just take about you know, 30, 45 seconds or so, see if you can um, find the reading, the reading um, assignment rather uh, for week three. We have a laughing emoji, but chapters seven or four through seven, Newton's law, a lot in the chat. Okay, ooh, oh, you guys are pretty good at this. All right, so I wanted to uh, follow up with that question and ask you how easy was it to determine that particular reading assignment based on um, how this information is laid out? Not easy, yeah, it's pretty difficult, isn't it? So. Uh, so this is an example of what it's like for somebody who uses assistive technology to consume information that's not accessible. It's all just a bunch of text, and then they have to go back and listen to it again to kind of tease out the information um, that they are really seeking. So I, I wanted to show you uh, the exact same content, but now the information is organized visually. We have headings um, that are a little bit more bold and they're a different color. We have a bulleted list uh, and a simple table that organizes the reading assignment uh, by week and by topic. Um, and then now we can see that the required reading for week three are chapters four through seven. So nice job to those folks who are able to, to kind of tease that information out from the previous example. Um, so what makes this information easier to consume than on the previous slide? Well, the answer is structure. On the previous slide, the text had no structure and we were really forced to interpret the information without any context. So structure provides that context to the user and it makes the content easier to understand and follow. So how do we create structure? Well, I'm gonna show you techniques for doing that in both Word and Google Documents. But before I go on to those specific techniques, um, 
for creating um, those digital documents, I wanted to provide an overview um, that also may help with uh, developing your content as, a, as an author. So many accessibility standards relate to content styling and layout, but for document accessibility, logical structure really helps to paint a clear picture in their user's mind. Um, and this is achieved by using navigation elements such as table of contents, uh, heading levels and lists. And I'll, I'll show you how to create those um, as we go through the presentation. Descriptive body copy uh, is sometimes overlooked, but that really does play a significant role in accessibility. Uh, content uh, should describe supporting materials that are included, um, and that really sets the frameworks for graphics. Uh, descriptive, body, uh, descriptive body copy really helps keep alt text short and to the point. Um, and you also want to make sure that you're providing a predictable user experience. So the relationship between headings and paragraphs, figures, page structure, that all allows uh, the reader multiple ways to navigate a document reliably and helps establish predictable patterns in documents, which also helps the reader gain familiarity with the content as they're cycling through the information. Okay, so um, now we're gonna go through specific techniques for creating accessible documents. And the first technique um, are uh, headings. So using headings as defined paragraph styles, that allows screen reader users to navigate from section to section and heading to heading, rather than being forced to, to listen to the entire content of the document from the top of the page to the bottom. So it's like that first example that we had with, with the page with no structure, it was just a bunch of text. So it's important to use headings to create that scaffolding as that forms an outline of the content um, rather than manually marking text as bigger and bolder by decorating uh, the font. Using paragraph styles provides anchor points um, that help screen readers navigate to the different sections. So uh, when using styles, this provides uh, that outline that I was uh, talking about that can be used uh, to also automate creating a table of contents that's based on that heading level. So it's an automated process. And that's really helpful if you have documents that are you know, uh, that have more uh, more pages, so about nine pages or more, um, then you want to use uh, those heading styles in combination with the table of contents as that provides more navigational uh, means. Um, and that benefits all users, not just users of assistive technology. So let's take a look at um, adding styles in Word. So on my screen here, I have um, that exact same example that we uh, looked at earlier. This is a, a, um, a fake uh, syllabi for a course introduction to physics. And uh, we do have headings that are included in this document here. And uh, to, get to, to, to get to this, to, to show those headings, there's a couple of different places where, uh, where that will be exposed. So the top here, we've got um, some different styles that appear, but um, to the right of that, I have, uh, I have this little tool here. And when I hover my mouse over it, the tooltip says styles pane. And when I select that, then I get a styles pane that pops out on the right-hand side. Um, I, I have to be working on a Mac, but this also, um, you know, doing these steps also works in um, Word for Windows as well. So I've got my list of uh, the different styles that are included within my document here. And I'm just going to highlight um, this particular uh, section of text right here. It says textbook. Um, and I can see that it is stylized as a, a heading level two. Um, and if I wanted to, I could actually change that style. And it's going to um, change all of the heading level twos within that document to match that style. So. Um, I can either assign a particular style by highlighting the text and then choosing that style from the, the styles pane, or if I wanted to, I can modify the style 
um, just by clicking on the right, uh, clicking on the drop down menu, and then the modify style dialog box opens. And then here I can do all kinds of things. I can change the font. Oops. Come on. I can change the font. I can change the size of the font. Um, I can you know, uh, bold it. I can add all kinds of different decorations to the font here. Uh, let's make that green. Um, and that's just in for uh, font formatting, but I can also add things like a border. Um, I can change the, the paragraph styling as well. But for our demonstration purposes today, uh, we'll just go ahead and leave it like this. I'm going to select OK. And then you'll notice that all of my heading level twos have changed uh, throughout the document. Um, so really nice and simple to do, to, to, to do that. So let's take a look in Google. I'm going to navigate to my web browser. So I have the exact same uh, introduction to physics course syllabi here as well. Um, and the, 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 the home bar, the, the home um, ribbon is a little bit different in uh, Google Documents. Um, so we have our, our text decorations that um, appear here in this, uh, this toolbar. So I can bold and make things italic. I can change the font. But really what I want to do is I want to look at the styles um, from this rich text editor. So if I hover my mouse um, over uh, just to the left of the text decoration tools, I've got my styles drop down. And this is the rich text editor that assigns um, the particular style to um, some text. So again, I'm going to highlight textbook. And I can see that it is styled as a heading level two. And if I select that drop down, um, so it's kind of similar to Word. I can um, I can highlight text and apply a heading, um, and uh, that will change it. Um, and I can also update uh, uh, the headings to match throughout the, the entire document as well. So if I change how this is going to look, maybe I'll change this to Calibri, and I'll increase the font size and make it bold. And then I can go back here and update heading two to match, and that's going to change the headings, heading level twos throughout the entire document. Okay, so pretty simple. Well, let's go back to our presentation, and we're going to talk about alt text. So um, alt text provides textual information to visual elements, um, such as images and charts and graphs. And uh, the alt text should provide a brief description of the image and why that image is relevant and included in your document. Alt text should be short and to the point about 140 characters or so, just enough information uh, to communicate the idea without burdening the, the, the user, the, the screen reader user with unnecessary detail. So simple images such as photos and logos should have alt text, um, as should more complex images such as charts and graphs. But images that are purely decorative or provide no additional information um, should be marked as decorative. So let's take a look at um, adding alt text in Word. It's pretty simple. I've got my image here. Um, I'm going to close my styles panel here. Um, I can select my image, right click on that, and then from the context menu, I can select view alt text, and that opens up uh, the alt text panel. And uh, in the center here is the, the field where you would enter your alt text information. Right below that is a checkbox to mark the image as decorative if it, if it actually truly is decorative. And when you do that, screen readers will just ignore the image and just keep uh, going on and, and announcing the next element within that document. Um, Microsoft has also included some artificial intelligence in some of their programs. So there is a button here that says generate alt text for me. Um, you know, you might want to try that and see if that helps with generating your alt text. Um, I find it's not that great, um, but I think over time that is going to improve. So I think the more that authors use this particular option for, for generating alt text, the smarter it will get. So um, something to be aware of um, as, as, uh, as time marches on. 
So let's take a look at the same thing in Google. I've got an image here. And to add alt text, I can right click on that and from the context menu, select alt text. Um, and the alt text panel in Google looks a little bit different. Um, I do have a description field here, but I also have an advanced options field to add a, um, a title. Now this is, um, this is optional. Um, you can add a title, but know that screen readers won't announce that information. It will, the screen reader will only announce alt text that is entered into the description field itself. Um, so just wanted to, to make everyone aware of that. Okay, let's head back to PowerPoint, but I wanted to pause here for now and see if we have any questions about heading levels or if we have any questions about alt text. There's a few questions in the chat. Um, the first one is from Jen. Um, she asks, is there a font size we should be using for different headings? Um, usually heading styles are already kind of predefined in, um, in Microsoft and also in Google Docs. You can modify them, of course, but they already are predefined. So in kind of the rule of thumb is that the heading level one is going to be, prop, that's probably going to have a bigger um, font size. Um, and then heading level two is gonna have a slightly smaller uh, font size. And then heading level three is gonna have a slightly smaller font size from there. So um, you want to kind of logically follow um, the, the level of headings and the size of your font for that heading level. So you don't wanna have your heading level three be a bigger and bolder font size than your heading level one. Visually, that's, that's not accurate. And also in terms of accessibility, it's not accurate. So, um, so that's kind of the rule of thumb there. Um, the second question from Tiana was, which heading styles are considered the most accessible? Well, they're all considered accessible. It's, it's um, more a matter of using um, those different heading styles accurately. So the title of your document should be stylized as a heading level one. Um, now in the styles pane, there is a style for title. And I have seen some authors use that title styling um, for, for that, uh, you know, in, in the documents. But unfortunately, that's not accessible. Um, the, 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 the short story is that titles are mapped to a paragraph. They're not actually mapped as a heading, uh, a heading style itself. So in your documents, the title of your document should be stylized as a heading level one. And then any sub, um, uh, a, a sub thought from your heading level one should be stylized as a heading level two. And then the sub thought from a heading level two should be stylized as a heading level three. So it should, again, follow a more logical uh, order when, you're, when you are placing your styles within your document. Okay, any other questions? No more in the chat. They both said thank you, so helpful. Great, okay, great. So let's move on to our next topic, which is uh, tables. So tables, they're very useful for communicating relationships between data, um, especially when those relationships are really best expressed in a matrix of rows and columns. Now, screen readers use table headers to announce column and row information, and that makes it easier for users to understand the data's organization and relationships. So if you're including a table in your document, make sure that that table uses very simple structure and does not include merged or split cells. Simple tables in Word and Google Docs can be made accessible by defining the header row, but complex tables can't, and those really should be simplified for clarity. Um, you also want to avoid using tables for layout, um, as that's really, really challenging for screen reader users to understand the relationship between uh, the information and also to control the read order. 
So let me show you the steps for defining the header row um, in a table that is included in a Word document. So let's go back to my Word document here. Um, and we do have a table. Um, so uh, when you add a table in a Word document, um, it, it, it's kind of nice, especially when, when um, the table is very simple. So we have a very simple table here with eight uh, rows and three columns. And uh, I can check the accessibility of this table by uh, selecting the table itself. And when I do that, I get a table design tab that appears um, at the top of my ribbon here. I can select that. And I've got these checkboxes that appear in the upper left-hand corner of, uh, of my, my ribbon. And by default, when you add a table into a Word document, header row is automatically checked and first column is automatically checked. And that means that the top row of your table is going to act as that, the table header. And also the first column is going to act as a, a header as well. So, and this allows screen readers to associate this heading information with the corresponding data and makes it very easy to understand which week, which topic, and which reading assignment in this example um, are, um, are associated with one another. Um, additionally, um, since I have my table already selected, I also have this layout um, tab that appears. If I select that, I can um, go into my properties uh, for this table. I'm gonna select the properties option from the ribbon and then the table properties dialog window appears. I'm gonna select the row tab in here and underneath options, I wanted to point this out. So underneath options, the, the top option is going to be selected by default. And it says allow rows to break across pages. You should uncheck that because Good tables should not have rows that go past um, go, that go past uh, your 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 page. Uh, it should be contained within that page. Um, and then you also want to select the second checkbox right underneath that that says repeat as header row at the top of each page. By default, that is not checked, and you should check that. And what that means is if you have a table that spans um, you know more than one page that header information is going to be repeated at the top of each page. So visually it helps with, um, with the header information and understanding that relationship between, um, between the header and the, the table data. It's a little bit different in Google. So let's switch gears and, and look at our browser. So I also have a table that is included um, in my Google document here. And you can see when I hover my mouse um, over each one of these rows, I get this little uh, um, graphic that appears to the right. Um, and it has kind of a little thumbtack icon and, and a plus. If I select the plus uh, button, it's gonna insert a row. Uh, but the little thumbtack is the way that you um, assign a header row in Google Docs. So it's already been assigned in this particular example. And when I hover my mouse over it, it says unpin header row. So I can unpin that. So right now, this is not a header row. It's just a, a table with eight rows and three columns um, with no header row. But um, I can click on this little thumbtack again, and that's going to um, it's going to create that top uh, row of that table as the header. Okay. So just want to pause here and see if we have any questions about tables before moving on. Um, does this apply to tables in Excel that have headers? Ah, uh, that's a great question. So Excel is kind of a different animal. Um, uh, Excel is a it's more of a spreadsheet program. Tables are different than spreadsheets. So um, spreadsheets it, or Excel already has kind of um, uh, built-in functionality for accessibility. So you don't really need to assign a header in Excel, uh, but you do need to assign a header in a table that is inserted into a document. So a little bit different um, uh, purposes for, for table, tables versus Excel. So hopefully that makes sense, the, the distinction between those. Any other questions?
Okay, let's go ahead and continue on. All right, uh, lists. Lists are another way of creating structure in documents um, as they help with logical sequencing and consistency and predictability. Um, in Word and Google Docs, um, you can use bulleted lists uh, to create, you know, uh, your 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 document your bulleted lists. There's also a number list option, um, and within both Google and Microsoft Word, if you have nested lists, so lists that are kind of uh, lists within a lists, um, there are different multi-level list tools to help with creating those those nested lists in varying degrees and uh, with numbers and bullets. And when screen readers encounter a list, it will announce how many items are in that list before it goes into the list. So we'll announce in this case, it will say there's a, there's a list with three items. And then as the screen reader user is, is navigating through that list, it will announce this is list item number one, create structure, list item number two, logical sequencing. So um, that semantic structure helps inform the screen reader user how many, uh, how many items are within that list and where they are within that list as well. And screen readers will also announce um, when there are nested lists, so they'll call those uh, sublists. And so it keeps track of where the user is um, when those lists are created using those list generating tools. So I just wanted to show you real quickly, um, we'll take a look in Google, um, how to use those different list generating tools. It's the same in Google, uh, in Word, as well as in Google Docs. Um, so, you know, you've got your where are they? Or here they are. We've got your um, your list generating tools. Um, you know, you can choose from a drop down for creating bullets or numbers. Um, and then in this case, you also have uh, uh, the option to create nested lists as well. So pretty simple to do that. Okay. Links. So meaningful hyperlinks in electronic documents make it easier for screen reader users to, to determine uh, what, what that link is about uh, before they actually decide to click on it. So rather than including um, a URL, which can have a long string of letters and sometimes characters, using meaningful hyperlinks helps the users to know something a little bit more about the destination of the link before they decide to click on it. Using descriptive text to create meaningful links um, is really important. Um, so you should avoid using language such as click here or follow this link, because it doesn't really indicate to the screen reader user where that link is going to go. So let's take a look at what a meaningful hyperlink looks like in Microsoft Word. Um, it's the same thing in Google Docs as well. So I um, just wanted to show you one example of that. So underneath the heading of textbook, we do have meaningful link text um, for the Introduction to Physics textbook second edition. So this is very meaningful. This tells me exactly uh, you know, what the textbook is. It's Introduction to Physics second edition. Um, and I can tell that this is a link because the text it looks different than the surrounding text, right? It's a different color. It has an underline. And when I hover my mouse over it, my mouse pointer changes from, um, from a cursor to a hand. Um, and then I also get a tool tip that tells me where that link is going to take me. I can edit this link, link by um, placing my cursor somewhere in the middle of that smart link information and then right clicking. And then from the context menu, I can uh, scroll down to hyperlink and then select edit hyperlink from there, from the context menu. And I can see I've got text to display in this upper field here. And then below that, I've got the address, uh, the URL for where that link is going to take um, that individual. So exact same steps in Google Docs as well. So I'm just gonna pause here to see if we have any additional questions before moving on. Okay, no questions. So let's go ahead and go back to our PowerPoint presentation. 
Language. Okay. So it's important to include the accurate language assignment um, to either an entire document or to specify a block of text within a document that is in another language. And this helps with proper pronunciation of content uh, and proper spelling and grammar when editing as well. So many screen reader applications, they do support, excuse me, multiple languages, and they can switch on the fly between those supported, uh, supported languages as well. So let's go back to Word, and we're going to take a look at this document again. If I scroll down to the bottom, I can see I've got um, a line of text down here that is definitely not in English. It's actually in French. Um, and so what I can do is it, to, to assign the language um, in Microsoft Word, um, I go to the Review tab, and then I select Language, and that's going to open up the Language dialog window. And then I can choose the appropriate uh, language for that particular uh, line of text. I can also do the same thing for the entire document as well. I can um, select the text for the entire document um, and then choose the appropriate language uh, from this uh, from this dialog um, window here. It's a little bit different in Google Docs. So let's go there, take a look at Google Docs. And I, I do have that same French language, uh, the uh, line of French text rather, that is included at the, uh, the end of this document. So I'm gonna highlight that. Um, and to change the language within Google, go to the file menu and then select the language pop out. And I've got a list of different languages here as well. Now, in this case, this is selected as English. So it's important to note that within Google Documents, if you change the language this in this way, it's going to change the language for the entire document. There's no way to isolate a single block of text and change that single block of text. It's either for the entire document um, and that's it. So something to keep in mind um, when you're working in, in Google Documents. It's not as flexible as, as Word documents are in this case. Okay, let's talk about more metadata here. Um, so document titles, um, uh, those allow screen reader users to get a little bit more information about that document. Um, and so when we provide that, it gives more contextual understanding um, without the need to actually open the document, which can take some time. So adding a document title and a summary and keywords and maybe an author, this is really helpful um, for the screen reader user to, to get that kind of metadata, that information, um, as it helps with page identification and also with uh, searching and, and indexing as well. So the steps, the techniques for that in Microsoft Word, oh, actually, you know what? I wanna go to Google first because um, a little bit different in Google. So the, the actual title in a Google document um, is, is, appears in the upper left-hand corner um, of the Google Workspace itself. So if I hover my mouse um, over the text field that um, it's an editable text field that appears in the upper right-hand hand corner, I get the tooltip that says rename, but really what it, it should say, it should say document title. Um, so that's a, a, an accessibility issue there. But this is where, um, where the user, the author, would enter in the title for this particular document. Let's go back to Word. Um, and to add um, a document title in Word for Mac, I'll show you um, a screenshot of how to do this in, in Windows. It's a little bit different. But to add a document title in Word for Mac, you go to the File menu and then Properties and then the summary tab. So this is where I can enter in all my, my metadata. I've got the title here, I've got the author, company, and then uh, I can add keywords if I wanted to and comments. So this is all indexable uh, and searchable. Um, let's go back to the PowerPoint presentation. Oops. There we go. 
Um, and I wanted to show you a screenshot of what this looks like uh, in Word for Windows. So in this case, uh, in Word for Windows, you would go to File, Info, and then you would see this information here. And uh, the properties appears in the uh, right-hand column of the info page. Um, so there's a lot, there's kind of a lot of text here, there's a lot of information. But you'll see that, um, you know, there is a spot to add title and tags. And when you place your cursor in that uh, field, this is an editable field right here. I know it doesn't look like it, but it is an editable field. So you can place your cursor in there and that's where you would change your title, add your tags. Um, and then you can also um, include the, the author information as well. So that's where you would add that particular metadata. Okay. Document accessibility checkers. Um, these are automated tools that can help the author with validating the technical accessibility of a document. Um, and in some cases, they can also help with fixing any issues that might appear in an accessibility report. Um, so it's important to note that accessibility checkers, they verify the document against a set of rules that identify possible issues that can cause barriers to accessibility, but it's not 100% perfect. Uh, but it does also provide feedback to authors and guidance on how to fix issues that can cause accessibility barriers. So there is an accessibility checker that is built into uh, Office 365 and, and Windows, and I'll show you how to access that in a bit. But Google does not provide an accessibility checker. But there is a third party plugin um, that's called Grackle, and that helps fill that gap. But unfortunately, at this time, Grackle products can't be, cannot be included in the UW instance of the Google Workspace due to some security concerns that we had. We, we actually checked it out a little while ago, uh, and um, it was determined that their security was kind of immature. But that's changed um, and they've made some many significant improvements to their security. So we're gonna go back and review that. And so it, uh, Grackle Docs may be avail available um, in, the, in the future. So stay tuned for that. Um, so let's take a look at the built-in accessibility checker that is built into Office 365. In this case, we're gonna take a look at Word and uh, to launch the accessibility checker, that's going to be included on the review tab of your office products. So we already happen to be on the review tab because we were looking at language. But you'll also notice that there's a check accessibility um, icon on the ribbon that appears as well. And when I select that, I get, um, I get the accessibility um, uh, report that appears on the right hand side. And this, this document is mostly accessible. So let me, I'm going to choose a different one. So let's look at this one. It's the same document, same introduction to physics course syllabus. Let's go to the review tab. I'm going to go to check accessibility. I've got the accessibility report that pops out here on the right-hand side. And I can see I've got some errors and some warnings. So errors are going to be definite barriers to accessibility and should be addressed or fixed by the author. Warnings could be potential barriers to accessibility and should probably also be fixed as well. And sometimes Word will provide tips to increase the accessibility. And tips aren't necessarily going to break accessibility, but are certainly going to help with, with uh, you know, maybe navigation or different um, aspects of accessibility of, of a particular document. The nice thing about this ex uh, accessibility report, the, the inspection results, is if I select that um, error, it's going to take me to the uh, specific place in the document where that error appears. And then just below the inspe uh, inspection results, I get some information here, some guidance as to why, uh, why this is an issue and why it should be fixed, and then some very concrete steps for how to fix this particular issue. So on, on this example, we have an object that does not have any uh, alt text. 
Um, so it gives us information as to why alt text for images is important. And then it gives uh, steps that I had um, uh, uh, shared with you earlier before on how to add alt text to this document. We can also see that we've got some warnings uh, that are included here. Um, and it says, uh, there's a warning, the use of merged or split cells can cause some, some issues for, uh, uh, for screen reader users. And we can see here that I've got a complex table that has some merged cells. And I mentioned earlier that if you're going to include a table in a Word document or a Google document to avoid those merged cells, because it's a little bit more challenging to understand the relationship um, of that data uh, with those merged and split cells. Okay. Let's go back to our PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Exporting or saving to, to PDF. So let's say we're starting off with an accessible Word document. Um, you took all the techniques that I had mentioned earlier um, and you created an accessible document. So the goal when exporting to PDF is to do that in a way that maintains the accessible features of the Word document that we had uh, implemented. So what PDF does is it preserves that the layout of a document for viewing and for printing. It also embeds the fonts and PDFs can be easily searched for specific keywords or phrases. Now, the steps for exporting a Word document to accessible PDF, it can be accomplished uh, two ways. You can either uh, choose Save as PDF from the file menu on either uh, Word or, uh, I'm sorry, either a Mac or document. Uh, geez, sorry, long week. On either Mac or Word, uh, choosing the Save as PDF uh, from the file menu there, and that will create a, um, uh, a tagged PDF, or if you have it enabled, um, you can select the Acrobat tab that may appear in your uh, instance of Word, and then you can choose create a PDF. So either option is gonna create a PDF document with tags. Um, and exporting a PDF document with tags from, from Google Docs is not supported at this time, but Grackle Docs uh, can help with that. So uh, again, something to, to look at in the future. Now the steps for exporting a PDF from Windows is a little bit different and I've included a screenshot of that on the next slide. So this is a screenshot of, um, of the Microsoft Word um, uh, export window. And from here, we went to File, Export, and then I selected Create Adobe PDF. And that opens up this Save as Dialog box right here. Um, now, what I did is I selected this button down here that says Options, and that opens up PDF Maker. And from here, you want to check and make sure that the third checkbox from the, the top says it says enable accessibility and reflow with tagged Adobe PDF. Now that should be selected by default, but sometimes um, you know if if there is an option within Microsoft Word to also reduce the file size of your 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 document as well. And sometimes if you do that, it's going to uncheck this feature. So um, you want to be sure to make sure that that is checked if you're uh, downsizing. Um, your documents when you're saving. Okay, so just want to pause here before um, going on to the PDF and see if we have any questions. Okay, all right, let's go ahead and continue on. Um, so what makes a PDF document accessible? Um, well, first of all, uh, an accessible PDF document, it must have tags. And the tags must have the proper semantic structure and be organized in a logical reading order. Essentially, tags in a PDF document are XML 
uh, XML-based coding um, inside that document, and that provides the structure and necessary semantic information for screen reader users um, that helps with navigation and also understanding the content. Accessible PDF uh, supports structured tables with proper header IDs, and it also supports alt text for images. And decorative images will be ignored if they're marked as decorative or, or artifacted. So that will carry over from the Word or uh, from the Word document, not necessarily from Google Docs, because it's not possible to create a tagged PDF from Google Docs at this time without Grackle. So for documents with nine or more pages, bookmarks will automatically be created. Um, and that helps with easier navigation between sections and headings. Um, and then document metadata, such as the title, the author, and language uh, assignment are also preserved as well. Now, according to the World Wide Web Consortium, or the W3C, PDFs are officially recognized as web content under uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG. And PDF UA is an additional set of standards that focuses on um, exclusively on creating more accept, uh, accessible PDFs. And uh, it's an international organizational standard as well. So the UA part of PDF UA um, is an acronym that stands for Universal Accessibility. And this standard defines the requirements for accessibility of PDF documents. And that helps determine how to implement WCAG success criteria. Now, the only way to tell if a PDF document is PDF UA compliant is to run an accessibility report with a third party application called PAC 2024. And that is available for free uh, for folks who use uh, Windows. It's not available for, for Mac users at this time, unfortunately. And PAC 2024 is managed by the PDF Association. And I've included a link to that product um, uh, at, the end of this, uh, at the end of this slide deck, which will be available um, to you guys as well from our, from our website. Now, this application, it does provide a accessibility report, um, and it lists any errors that it encounters, but it doesn't give the author the ability to correct those errors. So that has to be accomplished by uh, a, PDA, a PDF remediation software, such as Adobe Acrobat Pro. So let's take a look at a PDF document. This is the same syllabi that we've been looking at um, throughout this afternoon. And this is a PDF version of, uh, of the, the document itself. Now, I'm, I'm viewing this in Adobe Acrobat Pro DC. If you have Adobe Reader, you're not able to access uh, the tags. You're not able to edit um, a PDF document and look at the tags. But with Adobe uh, Adobe Acrobat Pro, you can. Um, now to expose the tag tree, you would go up to the view menu and then select show hide, navigation panes, and accessibility tags. And those tags are gonna pop out right here on the left-hand side. And if I place my cursor on the, the top um, tag here that says document, you notice that these there are magenta rectangles that surround some of the content. So this is all tagged content. And I'm going to use my arrow keys just to walk down the tag tree. And now you can see um, that only one of those magenta rectangles is encompassing a particular element on this document. So I can correlate the tags in the left-hand column to the actual content in the main window here of our, our PDF document. So I can see that um, that graphic is tagged as a figure, which is great. That's perfect semantics for that particular tag. If I continue to walk down, I can see that there's a heading level one uh, that is tagged for the introduction to, to physics course syllabus. So perfect semantics. I can also use the arrow keys to open up that tag and it mimics the text that I see on screen. And this is the text that is actually announced out loud by the screen reader. So the screen reader is gonna access this tag tree here 
and announce the 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 semantic uh, nature of that tag, and then the actual text that is contained within that tag itself. Okay. So I want to pause right here and see if we have any questions about PDF. Um, is there accessible is there is the accessibility report within UW a compliant? Uh, is the accessibility report within Adobe UA compliant? No, it's not um, UA compliant. The only tool that will assess for PDF UA compliance is the PAC 2024. So the, the built-in accessibility checker that is built into, um, into Adobe Acrobat, it does... Um, it does have some checks and balances against uh, the, the WCAG um, compliance, but it doesn't map accurately to PDF UA. So there are some, some gaps there. Um, so that's why I recommend that um, if you want true compliance with technical accessibility to, to use the PAC 2024 checker. And then can you please show us how to navigate to the accessible tag viewer again? Yeah, sure. So let me go ahead and close this. So to, to view the tag tree in Adobe Acrobat Pro, not in Reader, you're not going to be able to, to access those tags in Reader. In Adobe Acrobat Pro, you'd go to the View menu and then Show Hide, Navigation Panes, and then Accessibility Tags. Okay, any other questions? Uh, we have two more. Do you recommend also adding the link slash URL in front of the hyperlink text? Ah, uh, that is a great question. Um, it depends on how you're going to distribute your document. Um, usually, if if your document is going to be distributed electronically, then it's probably not necessary to include the URL. But if you're going to distribute your document in print form, that that you know that link is not going to be clickable in print form. So definitely in print form, you would want to include the URL probably in parentheses so that folks know where that location is going to be. So great question. And are there are there any alternatives to PAC 2024 for Mac users? Unfortunately, there aren't. Um, at this time. So it's it's kind of a limitation um, with, uh, with that platform. So yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let's go back to our PowerPoint presentation because I've got some resources that I want to share with you. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, this uh, slide deck will be available on our website along with a recording of this presentation as well. But it's going to take a couple of weeks until you know we get that um, uh, we get that information and, and do some editing of the content. Um, but I wanted to share this with you. These are resources. Um, so we have a link to creating accessible uh, documents, and that's linked to our website, um, Accessible Technologies. And then I've also included a link to the PAC 2024 Accessibility Checker as well. And I know I mentioned that Grackle's not um, available for our UW instance of the Google Workspace, but if you have a personal Google account or Gmail account, um, then you can install a trial version of, of Grackle. I believe it's, it's a, it is a, a paid third-party plugin, but I think that there is a trial, um, you know, a trial, period for, for using Grackle as well. Um, so you can follow this link and you can download Grackle for your own personal instance of, of Google Workspace and see how that, uh, how that works out for you. It's a little bit different than the um, accessibility checker that's built into Word. It's not as intuitive from, from my perspective, but it still is helpful in guiding authors and creating more accessible content in the Google Workspace. So I think it's worth it to check it out um, and see um, how that works. 
So last thing I wanted to share with you, if you have any additional questions um, that, you know, uh, maybe come up in the next day or so, you're, you're welcome to reach out to me. My email is gabyd at uw.edu. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about document accessibility. Um, and also wanted to put a plug in for next month's webinar series. It's going to be um, an, a continuation of uh, accessible documents, but this time we're going to look at PowerPoint presentations and Google Slides and how to create more accessible content uh, in those platforms. So I uh, look forward to seeing you all next month for that webinar. So thanks, everyone.